Welcome back to One Hit Wonderland, where we take a look at bands and artists known for only one song. And today I get to the final request of the four I sold on Patreon. It's been fun doing these. Might do this again, next time I'm going to auction them off or something. These things sold out quick. Now, as you might recall, our last requester wanted me to cover Rage Against the Machine, because they actually are sort of one hit wonders in the UK. But as an American, I told him I couldn't work with that. So eventually he sent me a better request. My life is brilliant. That's right, today we are looking at one of the newest one-hit wonders I've ever covered. Yes, we're going back to the recent past to cover the biggest one-hit wonder of 2006. Writer of one of the all-time wispy, willowy, wigwag acoustic hits, one James Blunt, who burst onto the scene with... Hold on, uh, he just messaged me something. I hope you didn't decide on James Blunt, blah, 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 change my request, blah, blah, turning Japanese by the vapors. Oh, thank Christ. <laughs> Welcome back, back to One Hit Wonderland, and friends, it's been too long since we had a good old 80s new wave act on this show. And while I have affection for all such one hit wonders, this is one of the best of the lot, and also one of the silliest. It's practically the definition of a novelty song. It's almost like they knew they'd have a short career. They named themselves The Vapors. They were like wisps of air that briefly registered, then vanished without a trace. But even if they quickly evaporated, their song has not. Turning Japanese, alongside Cars and Video Kill the Radio Star, was one of the first of the big one-hit wonders of the 80s. Or the 80s. 1980 specifically. And keep in mind that 1980 is actually a terrible year for pop music. I'm all out of love. I'm so lost without you. There wasn't much room for vapors in all the air supply we had. But that year also produced a number of goofy fluke singles which would set the stage for the entire decade to come. I mean seriously, this video is basically what you think of when you imagine a generic 80s music video. So come with me, won't you, as we explore this odd little number and its connection to the dawn of a genre, to vaguely understood Eastern culture, and to oblique references to touching yourself. Let's begin. Man, I did not want to do that James Blunt one. Okay, so there's this band I really like called The Jam. They were a punk band, or a post-punk band, it, it's fuzzy. They were kind of like The Clash, except a tiny bit more mainstream and accessible, and yet The Clash were the ones who crossed over in America. Mm. Yeah, they're definitely a music geeks band, at least in this country. I can't think of a reason your average person would have ever heard of them. But they were very popular in the UK, several number one hits. My favorite album from them is Sound Effects, but a lot of people also really like their 1977 album, In the City, and they, um... I'm getting off topic, aren't I? It's just they're a really good band. I'm, I'm a huge fan. The Jam are relevant to this story because they're the ones who discovered the Vapors. The Vapors have been opening for a bunch of UK punk acts, and the Jam's bass player caught one of their shows with his manager, and they were both like, man, we gotta sign these guys, maybe we should manage them. And uh, this was in 1979, so punk was quickly turning into New Wave, and, and the Vapors were kinda right in between there. So the Jam's manager started managing them, and they got signed, they recorded an album, which included, of course, Turning Japanese. And once everyone heard it, they were like, guys, this is perfect, this is gonna be an instant hit. But their lead singer, Dave Fenton, apparently realized, eh, it's not really the kind of song you wanna make your first impression with. <laughs> you might end up a one-hit wonder. <laughs> Can't have that. So they released this instead. I like this. It's, uh, it's nervy, edgy, like most good post-punk, but I've also heard a billion songs like it. Especially from The Jam, who The Vapors did, in fact, sound a lot like. Hey Dave, you know what would make a better single? Does anyone know what that Asian riff comes from? You know, da na 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 Try to look it up and no one seems to have a good answer. I got your picture. Turning Japanese is good because of two reasons. 
first, that guitar work is just awesome. I love every little riff of this song. But secondly, there's the chorus. It just grabs you, because, well, what does he mean? What the hell is he talking about? Is this some kind of Rachel Dolezal thing where he decided to change races? As Gregor Samsa awoke one morning, he found himself transformed into a Japanese person. I don't know. I mean, certainly I know of plenty of people who would love to turn Japanese, but I think Japanophilia was a little different back then. Back then, people associated Japan with historical stuff like samurais and cheap electronics. I see this and there's nothing else to do. So what does it mean? Well, you've probably already heard this one. It's one of the most persistent rumors in pop music history, that this song is about masturbation. Turning Japanese means jerking off. How? I've heard a number of theories about how this is supposed to make sense. Like, your eyes go squinty as you climax, you know, as you finish start squinting your eyes, like, hey, you, you can't see my eyes. I, I'm squinting, trust me. Or maybe Dave Fenton was ahead of the curve and realized that someday Japan would be very well known for its pornography. Yeah, Japan and masturbation go hand in hand. Or something in hand. Look, I'm not going to indulge this any further. It's not true. That's not what this song's about. The band has always, always denied it. But I can see why that theory would at least be plausible if you heard it. Okay, first off, he's British. God knows what the hell they're talking about half the time anyway. Secondly, it was the 80s. The 80s had a lot of songs that sounded like they were about some self-loving. So there was that. Also, the song is, at the very least, definitely about being lonely and bored. No sex, no drugs, no wine, no women, no fun, no sin. He's literally got nothing to do, except he's got a picture. I know what I'd spend most of my time doing in that situation. I mean, no I don't. Anyway. Boy, that line sure sounds a lot pervier when you think it's about wanking off. See, the thing is, if turning Japanese doesn't mean touching yourself, then what the hell could it possibly mean? I've been following pop music for a long time, and I have never, ever in my life seen an adequate explanation for where the hell turning Japanese even comes from. According to Fenton, it doesn't have anything to do with Japan even. Okay, well, it clearly has something to do with Japan. Da -na 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 -na. Regardless, it hit that perfect note of catchy and energetic and just weird enough to stick in people's brains. It was big in England, decently successful in America, and absolutely huge in Australia for some reason. Don't think in Japan, though. I wonder what they think of that song over there. They went on several tours in America and Australia, and then after they had turned Japanese, they turned into a puff of smoke and disappeared. The Vapor's first album was released in July 1980. The Vapors broke up in August 1981. Thirteen months. Dragonflies live longer than their career lasted. Having read the full biography of The Vapors, I have to say that this is the first time I'm covering a band whose story really resembles that thing you do, the ultimate one-hit wonder story. I mean, they got signed, got a hit, and flamed out really quickly. Not because of a specific reason, but just a whole bunch of things that all landed on them at once. I've listened to both their albums, and this is actually a really solid, underrated band. I mean, listen to this. This is pretty cool, right? I like it. But this band was pretty much doomed. First off, their first hit was Turning Japanese. Uh, that's not a song that changes your life when you're in high school. Secondly, most of their other stuff was not as silly as Turning Japanese, so if you did want to hear more, you'd probably be disappointed. And then there are a billion other things, just a perfect storm of bad luck. First off, they were overshadowed by that other, better, bigger band they were closely associated with. Also, there's that old standby, screwed by the label. Their label got swallowed by British music behemoth EMI, so they immediately got lost in the shuffle. And the musicians' union went on strike around that time, so they couldn't go promote themselves for a while. They were too busy touring to have time to write. At the same time, the manager was like, 
look, I have to focus on managing the jam. I like to imagine them calling up the jam. It's like, hey, want to hang out? I'm like, eh, we're all kind of busy right now, Vapors. Maybe we'll hang out later, you know, some other time. Call me. Bye. Do you want to feel good? Do you want to feel anything? Anyway, they did keep it together long enough to record a second album. And I guess Fenton was kind of worried about looking like a joke band, so the lead single off their second album was this. It's called Jimmy Jones. Sounds peppy, right? Uh, no. It's about the Reverend Jim Jones, the cult leader who murdered all his followers with poison Kool-Aid. Not really something you'd expect the turning Japanese band to start writing about. They also tried an image change, went from the standard punk outfit of, you know, skinny jeans and t-shirts to these silly, frilly blouse things. Not a great look. Oh, and the band hated each other too, so that didn't help. Also, they got hit by meteors, and their Stonehenge set was too small, and there was probably a Yoko in there somewhere. Like I said, just everything all at once. So, that was it. Now hold on, this is great. Now, the rest of the band all, you know, got real jobs, and uh, Fenton released one obscure solo record, tried to start a bunch of other bands, none of which ever got anywhere or released anything. He kicked around for a decade at various odd musical jobs, you know, songwriting, producing. But eventually, when you're a failed pop singer, there's only one real option for you. You go into law! Yeah, not kidding. He's a lawyer now. An actual suit and tie lawyer who does law things. Or, excuse me, a solicitor. Specifically, he is the in-house counsel of the UK Musicians Union. He apparently doesn't hold the strike in 1980 against them. So, you know, that's what he does now, helping out the little guy, getting poor broke garage bands out of their bullshit slave contracts that greedy record execs force on them. Isn't that cool? You know what I want? I want a TV show for this guy. Think about it, it could be like this LA Law kind of thing with the ex-pop singer turned lawyer taking cases, dealing with fallout from his rock star past, it could star James Spader. Seriously, if any producers want to take a go at it, I really think you should. Give me credit though. Yes. Yes, I really think so. Or how about this? They deserved the opportunity to see if they deserve better. No, seriously, they hold up. My life is definitely a tiny bit better because I listen to them. So if you want to hear where punk started turning a new wave, you could really do worse. Good band. And if you get the chance, you should really check out the jam. Seriously, you know, check out Town Call Malice or That's Entertainment, Beat Surrender. I'm done. I'm gonna